Good afternoon. I'm Professor John Jackson, the chairman of the college's 9-11 committee, and it's my pleasure to serve as master of ceremonies for this important event. Today marks the 19th anniversary of the cowardly attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the grassy field in Pennsylvania. Much has happened to the world since this fateful day, and it is highly appropriate that we pay our respects to the patriots and others who have perished in this long fight over nearly two decades. We're conducting this virtual ceremony today due to the ongoing pandemic, but the college was determined to conduct a suitable ceremony regardless of the unique circumstances in which we find ourselves this year. Looking back on September 12th, 2001, we first learned that one of the Naval War College's fleet seminar students had died in the terrorist attack on the Pentagon. A committee was established that day to commemorate this sacrifice. In the days and weeks that followed, we learned of other students and of college alumni who also perished in this tragic event. As word of these losses circulated within the Naval War College family, donations of money, material, and services quickly began to be received by the Naval War College Foundation. The memorial was dedicated in September 2002 and is the end result of their generosity. The focal point of the memorial is a broken fragment of limestone from the west facade of the Pentagon, which was carefully conveyed to Newport by a team of Navy Seabees. This stone, though damaged, is standing upright, signifying the restored and strengthened Pentagon building and the continued strength of the United States Armed Forces. The final tally from the cowardly attack showed that three students who were actively enrolled in the fleet seminar program and eight Naval War College alumni had been killed while on the job serving their country. Their names are inscribed on a bronze memorial plaque and their memories along with those of the thousands of others who were killed that day are enshrined in the hearts of all Americans. I now invite Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, the 57th president of the Naval War College, to offer her thoughts on this solemn occasion. Admiral. Thank you, Professor Jackson. I would like to first recognize the DeCanto family from Cape Cod, who normally come to the Naval War College every year in memory of their son and brother, Navy Captain Gerald F. DeCanto. Jerry graduated in 1998 and was in the Pentagon during the attacks on 9-11. Joining us virtually today is his mother, Mrs. Pat DeCanto, his sisters, Ms. Marie DeCanto and Ms. Dale Choate and her husband, Mr. Tom Choate, his brothers, Mr. David DeCanto and Mr. Ray DeCanto, who came to the campus this morning to participate in our annual memorial service. Thank you, Ray, for your touching words. I would like to also recognize our Naval War College Foundation, who graciously provided a ceremonial wreath for the occasion. I'd like to welcome our Naval War College community, our Naval Supply School community, our Navy Band Northeast, and our families and friends. Today is an important day. It has been 19 years since we were attacked on American soil at the heart of our economic trade and the very soul of our national defense. We suffered two different types of loss that day. One was tangible, the heart-wrenching loss of human life and the immensity of material from within the buildings that fell. The other was symbolic. The Twin Towers and the Pentagon represent two of the most iconic and recognizable buildings in the country. They stand for strength, success, and the vitality of our great nation. We were stricken at our core that day. Our resolve was tested that day. First responders, school teachers, politicians, students, men, women, and children stood together. We shouldered the grief together, and we rebuilt from the ashes together. We suffered a tragic loss, but are as a result standing here today stronger than we were before together. Mother, 
father, brother, sister, husband, wife, son, daughter. Those that perished on that faithful day were called by these names, by the people who loved them. We each may not have lost a friend or a family member on September 11th, 2001. And we may not have been first responders or direct witnesses or one of the 6,000 survivors. But I am sure that like me, we all who were alive on that day remember where we were when we first heard of the attacks. We remember what went through our minds as we watched the news reports the panic, the confusion, the sadness, and the anger. We are all sons and daughters of someone. Many of us, also brothers in arms, shipmates, squadron mates, classmates, friends. We can all put ourselves in the shoes of someone left behind on that day. We can all imagine what it must have been like to call to leave a voicemail and to call again. Voicemail after voicemail, checking in on someone who would never call back. Tragedy and loss are not reserved for the unlucky. And one day we will all face our death, whether we are ready for it or not. And the reality is death is hard. And it is often tragic. 2,977 people died that day of which 10 were from this family, our family. Graduates, former faculty, or staff who once called the Naval War College home. It is important that we never forget their sacrifice and that we honor their memory. They were patriots who believed in what this country and this institution represents, an unwavering defense of freedom. Freedom has never been free. It has been paid for over and over again with sacrifice and countless lives. The brave men and women of this nation have stood tall and bravely walked that line for centuries to protect our citizens, our rights, and our God-given freedoms. Shortly after 9-11, Sitting President George W. Bush addressed the nation with a formal statement. He said, attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. We are a country of warriors, made strong by our interwoven history, our varying ethnicities, our culture, cultural heritages, and each individual story. Here at the Naval War College, we educate the next generation to go out and lead their countries as war fighters, as diplomats, and as public servants. Brave men and women who may one day lead the charge on the battlefield, or as our comrades did 19 years ago today, as heroes under siege. It is our duty as fellow Americans and fellow service members to not let their sacrifice ever be in vain or to be taken for granted. It is our duty to stand up for what is right to stand for justice, peace, and equality, to reject those elements of an international system that would permit harboring or enabling of actors who would strike without honor a civilian population at home in their cities. We honor the memory of our lost ones by continuing to that fight, by being first and sometimes by being the only ones sailing upwind into troubled waters, always protecting our citizens and the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which we believe are the core of universal human values. 
We will never forget the date, September 11th, 2001. We will never forget the debt we owe our fellow War College comrades, all who gave their lives for freedom. Our compassion for their families must never fade. Our courage to carry on must never waver. On this 19th year of remembrance, may God bless those lost, their families, and our great nation. Thank you very much, Admiral, for those uh, stirring remarks. I'd now like to take just a little bit of time to talk about each of the patriots that we're saluting today. Captain Gerald F. DeCanto. Captain DeCanto was a 1998 graduate of the Net College of Naval Warfare. Following his commissioning from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1979, he served in a wide array of engineering and operations assignments on surface combatants, culminating in command of the guided missile frigate USS Simpson. He was serving as director of the current operations and plans branch in the Navy Command Center at the time of the attack. As the Admiral mentioned, we're honored that members of the Captain DeCanto's family are with us here today on this Zoom session, and Ray DeCanto will be offering his remarks in just a few minutes. We pause to remember Captain Gerald F. DeCanto. Lieutenant Commander Robert R. Elseth completed his War College studies through the Fleet Seminar Program here in Newport, Rhode Island. A graduate of the Ohio State University, he served on surface combatants in engineering and weapons positions for a decade before transferring to the Naval Reserve. He was a reservist serving on active duty in the Navy Command Center at the time of the attack. We pause to remember Lieutenant Commander Robert R. Elseth. Captain Lawrence D. Getzfred completed his Naval War College studies in 1990. He enlisted in the Navy in 1963, completed Aviation Officer Candidate School in 1972, and then served as a Naval Flight Officer in the patrol aviation community. He served in a number of leadership positions, including command of Patrol Squadron 40. He was in the Navy Command Center when it was attacked. We pause to remember Captain Lawrence D. Getzfred. Miss Angela Marie Houts was a student in the college's fleet seminar site in the Pentagon. She was a civilian employee of the Department of the Navy and had been recently promoted to senior day analyst in the Chief of Naval Operations Intelligence plot the youngest person, military or civilian, to ever hold that post. She celebrated her 27th birthday on September 6th aboard a Navy frigate during an orientation cruise and perished in the Navy Command Center. We pause to remember Ms. Angela Marie Houts. Lieutenant Commander Patrick Jude Murphy completed his studies at the college's fleet seminar site in Great Lakes, Illinois. He attended the Navy Nuclear Power School, graduating in 1986. He subsequently served aboard both fast attack and fleet, fleet ballistic missile submarines. He was serving a three-week active duty assignment in the Navy Command Center at the time of the attack. We pause to remember Lieutenant Commander Patrick Jude Murphy. Lieutenant Jonas Martin Panic was studying national security decision making at the college's fleet seminar site in Annapolis, Maryland. While a student at the Naval Academy, he excelled as a football player and a power lifter. After graduating in June 1997, he completed the Naval Intelligence Officer's basic course. He was assigned as fleet intelligence briefer within the Chief of Naval Operations Intelligence plot 
and was on duty in the Navy Command Center at the time of the attack. We pause to remember Lieutenant Jonas Martin Panic. Captain Jack D. Punches, U.S. Navy retired, graduated from the College of Naval Command and Staff in 1985. A naval aviator for 27 years, he retired from active duty in 2000 and was serving in a senior civilian position as deputy head of the Navy Interagency Support Branch at the time of the attack. We pause to remember Captain Jack D. Punches. Commander Robert A. Schlegel completed his studies at the college's fleet seminar site in Norfolk, Virginia. As a surface warfare officer, he served aboard cruisers and destroyers, including a tour as executive officer of the destroyer USS Arthur W. Radford. He was serving as the Dep Deputy Current Operations and Plans Branch Head at the time of the attack. We pause to remember Commander Robert A. Schlegel. Commander Dan Frederick Shanauer was a fleet seminar student and a naval intelligence officer, having served in a number of assignments, both afloat and overseas. In May 1997, his article, Freedom is Not Free, was published in the U.S. Naval Institute. In the article, he recalled the death of four shipmates a decade earlier aboard USS Midway. A quote from his article has been incorporated into the memorial. He was serving as officer in charge of the Chief of Naval Operations Intelligence plot at the time of the attack. We pause to remember Commander Fr Dan Frederick Shanauer. Lieutenant Colonel Kip Taylor graduated from the College of Naval Command and Staff in 1998. The son of a career Army officer, he was a member of the Army Adjutant General Corps with extensive experience in administrative and personnel matters. On 11 September 2001, he was serving as military assistant to the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel, Lieutenant General Timothy Maud, who also died in the attack. Kip was posthumously promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Kip's wife, Nancy, gave birth to a second son months after the attack and then passed away from cancer the following year. Kip's brother is raising the boys. We pause to remember Lieutenant Colonel and Mrs. Kip Taylor. Captain John D. Yam Nicky, Sr., U.S. Navy retired, was a graduate of the Naval War College class of 1967. He was aboard American Airlines Flight 77 when it destroyed the west facade of the Pentagon. At age 71, Captain Yam Nicky was the oldest person to die during the Pentagon attack. A member of the U.S. Naval Academy class of 1952, he served with distinction as a Navy fighter pilot test pilot and astronaut candidate, ultimately serving as director of the Navy Test Pilot School in Pax River, Maryland. We pause to remember Captain John D. Yamnicki, Sr. As you've heard, this list includes officers and civilians, men and women, active duty and reserve officers, Navy and Army personnel, junior officers just beginning their careers and retired officers still serving in civilian jobs. It is a cross section of our military forces and evidence that patriotic sacrifice is not limited to any one group or category of Americans. Earlier today, Rear Admiral Chatfield and Mr. Ray DeCanto placed a wreath at the 9-11 Memorial here on campus. We will now share a video of that ceremony. Ha <laughs> ha 
Captain Ray DeCanto's brother, Captain Jerry DeCanto's brother Ray will now offer his reflections on the events of 9-11. Good afternoon. First, on behalf of the DeCanto family, we extend our thanks to the Naval War College, especially Admiral Chatfield, Professor John Jackson, and Professor Tom Gibson, Gibbons, for extending invitation to my family for the past 19 years to attend the 9-11 ceremony at the War College. It is our honor and privilege to attend the ceremony to honor these fallen heroes. Captain Joe left the Conto was my older brother. Now being brothers, we're always trying to build each other's character. In 1979, I remember helping Jerry in this endeavor when he graduated from the Naval Academy and decided to go surface warfare. I said something like, doesn't Admiral Rickover say something like, there are two types of vessels, submarines and targets? Uh, this was not that well received, but I clearly remember when Jerry returned to Newport in 1998 as commander of the fast frigate USS Simpson, FFG-56, he took particular delight in showing me the anti-submarine sonar array. So much for surface ships being targets. Now, the Simpsons efficiency rating was not all that good when Jerry took over command, but by the time he turned over to the next commander, the ship had the best efficiency rating for fast frigates in his squadron. That is not to say he was all business, or he didn't have fun, and he clearly did not take himself too seriously, despite his accomplishments. He would refer to himself as the head homer, this was an homage to the Simpsons TV show, and of course, Homer Simpson, who was the mumbling dad in the show. Today, we take time to reflect on those nearly 3,000 lives that we lost on 9-11. Here at the War College, we especially remember those eight graduates and the three students who perished on that day in defense of, our, of this great country. As it states on the 9-11 memorial, freedom is not free. Which brings me to a subject that frustrates my family. I suspect that there are many in the audience that are not familiar with the name Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Mr. Mohammed was apprehended in March of 2003 and is the accused mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. It is incomprehensible that he has and his four other alleged conspirators have not yet been brought to trial in 17 and a half years since their apprehension. For comparison, following World War II, at the Nuremberg trials, run by four countries, the government <clears throat> was able to try and complete this trial in just under a year. I hold some of the members of the government accountable for this failure to bring these alleged murderers to justice. Political agenda has mired the progress of the, this trial and not the pursuit of justice. Time is running out for the current older generation of family members that would like to see closure on this painful chapter in their lives. In closing, I'd like to remember those who fell in the service of this country and made the ultimate sacrifice, and I'd like to thank all those folks in the armed services that protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. I pray for peace, for justice, and for the safety of our military. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ray, for those uh, outstanding remarks. And uh, we've been honored to have you and your family on campus every year since 2002. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon and honoring the memory of these great Americans. After a brief pause, Admiral Chatfield will commence the Naval War College Town Hall meeting. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Professor Jackson, for uh, being the MC of the ceremony, and thank you, Mr. DeCanto, for attending and partic participating as you always do. Uh, before we begin the town hall, I'd like to remind everyone to please submit your questions via the chat function. Um, I, uh, will, I will be moderating uh, today's town hall and helping uh, manage the questions and answer. Uh, for, those, um, for those new students who don't know me, uh, I'm Captain Joe Girard. I'm the Chief of Staff of Naval, Naval War College. And, uh, I wasn't here for the last town hall, so I'm, I'm happy to be here for this one and look forward to uh, the questions and answers and hearing from uh, all of you what your concerns are. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Admiral Chatwood. Hello and good afternoon. I'd like to begin this town hall meeting uh, with a moment of silence as we have done so many times in the past. On this day in particular, we know that many hearts are heavy and many people are still experiencing uh, grief and remembrance of their lost loved ones. Uh, we know that there are others in our country uh, who are suffering from uh, sickness and from uh, the devastating consequences of COVID-19 and others still who are engaged in raising our awareness across this country of uh, social injustice that uh, they and their families and members of their community have experienced over time. And so I ask for just a moment of silence today. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure today to be in front of you and to engage with you again at a town hall meeting. And I would like to start by turning the meeting over to our chief of staff so that he can explain some of the changes that have happened uh, in our current uh, testing of a new way for us to uh, determine who may enter into the building. And so chief of staff, uh, Captain Gerard, I really hope that you'll walk us through what some of those changes are and what we're learning. Thank you, Admiral. Um, many of you already know, some of you don't. Uh, we've recently transitioned from a mission essential personnel only posture uh, to what we're calling phase two of our reopening. Now the transition um, to, to phase two carries with it uh, a, de a delegation of approval access for uh, entering uh, campus buildings. So while we were mission essential, uh, we had people who were on a, on a list that were identified as, as mission essential personnel that could access campus. And anyone else who needed to enter campus uh, needed to get my permission for a, a brief and temporary trip into campus, whether it's to retrieve materials um, uh, in their offices or, or that sort of thing. Uh, with the switch to phase two, I am getting out of the business of approving uh, access and that has been delegated to the dean's level. Uh, so, so each dean will be managing for their staff and faculty uh, the, their, their physical footprint on campus. Now we're going to continue uh, utilizing telework as much as we can. We're also gonna continue with uh, delivery of education via online uh, mechanisms, Zoom and, and Blackboard, Collaborate and the tools you're already using. Uh, so in some respects, this shift to phase two is not a significant increase in our physical footprint, but what it's designed to do is to begin allowing us to exercise a proficiency at spending more time on campus. And this proficiency is gonna help us with following all the COVID-19 mitigation measures that we have put in place to practice all those things that we need to do to keep our workforce safe and healthy and to enable us to achieve our mission. Uh, while we're in phase two, uh, I'd like you to know that the threat working group is hard at work on looking at what phase three looks like. And the primary feature of phase three, and I'm sure many students uh, are eager to hear this, is some limited uh, measured face-to-face -face interaction on campus uh, in your seminar groups. We're mapping out what this looks like. We're mapping out how we manage it. Uh, rest assured where we are now with all online education and where we intend to go in the future, which is back to in-person, in-residence uh, education, this is a transition process. And we're deliberately taking our time with it so that we can learn from any mistakes or missteps along the way to prevent uh, health issues and to allow us to successfully uh, achieve our mission. Uh, there'll be some very technical challenges we have to overcome because as an example, if we have a seminar that's meeting on campus, and one of the seminar members is ill or not feeling well, and, and we therefore want you to stay away from campus uh, in that case, we need to have a mechanism for that seminar member to be able to remotely connect to their seminar discussion. So that's just one of the many challenges we're working through. As I said, we're, we're taking our time, and one of the questions that actually came in earlier today uh, was about when, when we're gonna reopen. And so I'm 
I'm addressing that right now, uh, what this looks like, but we need to be very deliberate. We'll begin with a small group, a small number of seminars, periodically meeting so that we can evaluate some of these technical challenges before we begin opening the, the aperture. So that's the plan on the, uh, on the seminar meeting piece. And I, I suspect uh, later on today, uh, Dean Hahn uh, might kind of address that from his perspective as the Dean of Academics. I'm, I'm more addressing it on the technical level, on the tactical level as uh, the, the chair of the threat working group as we work through some of these challenges. On the student side, we have a beta test in progress right now for granting a limited number of students uh, access to our learning commons in order to have a, qu a quiet place to study, reflect, read, and write. So this is outside of your normal seminar discussions. Um, the, the bar we put in place for who qualifies for this access is still a little high, but we intend to reduce that over time as we learn more about uh, how we can manage the, the comings and goings of the students during a morning or an afternoon session uh, based on when their core uh, curriculum is meeting. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to push out information through the Dean of Students uh, about that program. And we also have, again, on a very limited basis for those moderators uh, who observe students that are having a, a very difficult time keeping pace with the, the seminar discussions based on uh, bandwidth issues potentially or based on learning environment issues uh, with, with moderator input, um, we're, al we're allowing a very limited number of students to access classroom space for use during the seminar discussion. Again, the bar is quite high on this. Uh, we, we are really looking to help find the resources we need for those students who might be struggling uh, extra hard during this time. Uh, one of the things in, in the question that I received earlier today, one of, the que one of the questions was, hey, Rhode Island's opening, the Rhode Island schools are opening, why can't we open? And uh, I've, I've made this point before, one of the unique aspects of adult learning models is that we have a greater ability to accomplish our educational mission um, remotely than do elementary, uh, middle and high school students. Uh, especially on the elementary uh, school students. It is just so difficult for kids to, uh, to get their education remotely. We've learned that over the last six months, and that's why there's such an imperative to, uh, to open up our schools. We have the luxury of having the technological tools in place to allow us to continue the virtual classrooms that we have now, while we carefully and deliberately make plans and preparations to return to in-residence uh, education. Admiral, with that, I'll turn it over back to you and uh, I'll begin going through the questions that are coming in through the chat. Uh, thank you, Kaz. Uh, and I'll pause here because I know that Dean Hahn may have something to add to what you just said. So Dean Hahn, if you'd like to come on. Admiral, how do you have me? Slide clear? Yep, well, clear. Welcome, welcome Naval War College family. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the cause for his leadership and all the individuals on the threat working group have been working so hard over the last few weeks and months to try to put us in a position uh, where we are uh, to, to the point where we can consider the next steps for more student engagement. In terms of our priority, the first step has been this beta test to be able to allow students who really need the time and space access to the campus. And the beta test, there's been a lot of work going on with the library to have this beta test to be able to provide that space. The next step, and this is all based upon conditions being safe to do so, um, is to allow for some limited face-to-face -face contact. Uh, you can think of in terms of tutorials, one-to-one -one meetings with faculty and students, but also in terms of the uh, mission of the War College to educate leaders, one of the primary means by which you learn is our students learn from each other. That's why they're here, that's why they're mixed in joint classrooms, and the ability to get to know each other and develop networks that will last their professional career is critical to the joint PME construct for education. And so we are looking right now for ways to make that engagement. 
we've reached out to the faculty and a lot of the faculty feedback, to be honest with you, is it, it's working right now. We're teaching well. Why would we risk right now what we're doing? And the point is we're not risking right now. What we've learned is it takes several months to put into place the conditions to be able to transition. And so if we don't begin looking at where it's possible to engage now, we won't be able to engage in the winter or even in the spring, depending on conditions. We have to figure out right now. And so right now there's a couple of seminars that are actually doing some tests for us. Uh, I give a shout out to uh, CNWS and the Halsey Group for their engagement that's given us some data. We know that Moz will soon be doing some classified classroom work. It'll give us a little bit more data. And as we begin to transition and, and um, towards a more physical footprint, we have to realize that we are a resident education, um, um, a resident program. You know, we, our faculty was built, our curriculum was developed for face-to-face -face engagement. This virtual environment, which we've been in for six months, I get it. It's easy to get comfortable doing it the way that we do it, but that's not what this college is about. And when we're in a position to safely get there, we're going to transition back to the best environment for our students learning, which is our number one priority. Now, given that, the president's been very clear, and I, I am too, that uh, the number one objective is our people's safety. And so we're not going to do anything that's going to risk that safety. But also there is a, uh, in any type of decision, a risk reward type of trade-off. And so I just wanna commend again, uh, Captain Gerard and the threat working group's effort to begin this discussion and move forward so that we can get back to the type of teaching and learning that all our faculty and students wanna get back to. Over. Thank you, Dean Hahn. And uh, I want to echo what you said about the threat working group and uh, the many hours, uh, the robust discussions, uh, the great expertise, and uh, the, the effort, collective effort that's gone into uh, assessing the risk and keeping us safe. So thank you again. I'd like to take a moment here before we uh, shift over to questions uh, to make an announcement uh, because we've had um, a selection for two of our endowed chairs. And so I'd like to announce to you that Dr. Peter Dombrowski has been chosen as the next William B. Ruger National Security Economics Chair. So I'm gonna get my virtual claps up. And congratulations to Dr. Dombrowski. And I'd also like to announce that Dr. Christopher Jasparo has been chosen as the next Captain Jerome E. Levy Chair of Economics, Economic Geography and National Security. So congratulations to both uh, faculty members for your selection. What an honor. And we are so proud to have you move into those uh, endowed chairs. And now I'll turn it back over to the Chief of Staff who may have some questions coming in from our, um, our community. Thank you, ma'am. Um, first, uh, I appreciate the, the acknowledgement of the Threat Working Group's efforts so far. And I'd like to really deflect uh, any thanks that's coming to me and, and make sure that the, the, it's going to the team. And early on, we recognized that uh, no one person is gonna be able to figure this out and that uh, we need to put our collective heads together to work through these really difficult challenges, come up with ideas, poke holes in the ideas to, to figure out where things aren't fully thought out. And again, we, we couldn't do it without the whole group of uh, about 30 to 35 people on any, any given day. So thank you, uh, Threat Working Group, for um, helping us sort through this. Uh, we do have a couple questions, ma'am. And I, I think several of them actually would fall to me to answer based on kind of my recent comments about the uh, about the shift to phase two. Uh, two of the comments have to do with the in, in, impending foul weather that we're gonna see, right? As we approach winter time, the weather's gonna get worse. Uh, one of the uh, concerns is, are we gonna expect a flu shot X? And the answer is that the clinic, our naval uh, medical clinic, is developing plans for delivering a flu vaccination. They don't have it yet. Uh, they, I think they're looking at uh, October or even as late as early November. 
And they're also developing a plan that's going to be different than a normal flu shot X, which tends to cycle many, many people through a very uh, uh, quick process to get as many doses delivered as possible. And obviously that's not very conducive to the COVID-19 environment. So the clinic will distribute their plan when they have it. Uh, but in the meantime, yes, we are planning on delivering a uh, flu vaccine. Uh, the other uh, winter weather question is one that is uh, also vexing my children. And that is the question of, wait a minute, if we have all this on online education set up, does that mean there's no more snow days? And the answer is snow days might be a thing of the past. You know, we'll, we'll figure out what that looks like, but uh, we have these, the tools to, in place to allow us to continue moving forward even when there is uh, a, uh, a snow event. So uh, unfortunately, we may have to uh, think of uh, snow days in, in, the, in the past tense. Um, there was a very good question about metrics that were used uh, to, to assess the shift to phase two. And I think the following question is, what's, what are the conditions going to be to shift to phase three? And, and really what I've uh, talked about repeatedly is the idea of three things really being in place. <clears throat> First, we've got the plans and preparations in place to move to the next step in a, in a safe and effective manner. Uh, second, we've developed the proficiency with our existing COVID-19 measures. Uh, ju jumping week by week from phase one to phase two to phase three would not allow time to develop that proficiency and, and build those habit patterns of good social distancing and mask wearing and hygiene and all the very detailed uh, COVID-19 measures that we have in place that are actually different at different locations in the college because each uh, kind of local area on campus has its own unique mission requirements and in physical context. So we've had to really do a lot of planning to make sure we're doing this that fits in every location. And the third thing is the external conditions. Uh, right now, knock on wood, uh, Rhode Island is experiencing quite favorable conditions uh, relative, relative to some other states. We've got a low positivity rate. We've got a relatively no, low number of uh, new cases uh, per 100,000 people in, our, in the state. And so those are all positive uh, factors that would, would lead us, to, if, the, if those external conditions continue, would lead us to continue moving forward based on, as I said, the plans in place and the, uh, and the proficiency developed those habit patterns to uh, implement the measures uh, well. So that's, that's the answer to that question. Uh, I also received a question about how can a seminar volunteer to be a test case? That's an excellent question. And as a threat working group reaches a point where we've got tentative plans in place enough, we'll be reaching out to the Dean of Academics and the department chairs to identify who might be a, a good candidate to execute a test. So thank you for that question. Um, we're not ready yet, but uh, we certainly are thinking about it. Um, Admiral, uh, many questions and comments have come in. Uh, so uh, if possible, I'd like to turn it back over to you or maybe to uh, Commander Brown, uh, Frank Brown, who's representing Dean of Students, uh, to hear an update from them, and then I'll be able to help moderate the follow-on questions. Okay, I'll go first um, before Frank goes. And it is uh, it goes without saying that even as we look toward the future, uh, and we are hopeful and optimistic uh, that we also have to prepare uh, for another uh, outbreak or an increase in cases. And so I've asked the threat working group uh, through the chief of staff to make sure that we have red lines in place that we know when we need to actually fall back. So we are preparing for all the eventualities. I have spoken with uh, Marine Corps University, who is back face to face, but at 50% density. And I have spoken uh, with General Hecker, who uh, is at Air University, and who has, uh, fortunately for him and for his community, access uh, to medical testing that we do not. So there are a number of factors that uh, each of the colleges have to take into account. And we are in communication uh, with each other, uh, as well as with our Naval Postgraduate School and the United States Naval Academy, uh, all who face different types of community spread uh, and other factors uh, with their student bodies. So uh, thanks for that question, but we are uh, talking a lot with our peer institutions. And now over to you, Frank. 
Admiral, thank you for the opportunity this afternoon and great ceremony earlier, outstanding. I did see a question come in from one of our students about some travel. Um, Captain Dieterle had put out some good information about that. But yes, our local proximity area for travel is still 175 miles is considered the local. So if you are looking to go outside of that, as far as the students go, our military students, that, that's applied for through your service directors. And then we consider that as an exception to policy. So work through your uh, service advisors and send those requests up and we consider them on a case by case basis. So thank you for that question. And as the cause mentioned, it was very exciting to have some students on campus. It had been uh, rather lonely in the corridors for the last several months, but I was uh, very enjoyed getting to do face to face with a couple of our students or mask to mask as it were, uh, to give them a little bit of the lay of the land with the library commons. And next week, we'll also be having some students come outdoors to campus to do their student class student photo and to receive their access badges as we're hoping to provide more access as we go forward. But as the cause mentioned, we are still very restrictive in the access. So through your moderators and professors within your seminar groups, if you do have uh, internet con connectivity issues or serious um, issues with a lot of traffic in your household, as it may be, um, voice those up through your moderators and professors by your seminar group and get them to your services advisor and then into us in the Dean of Students office. And we propose those up the chain of command as an exception to policy to come in during this beta phase. And uh, we do have about four students taking advantage of the, the classrooms at this point, one per classroom. And then we have other several other students that are accessing the learning commons for some quiet study time and research space to write their papers. So again, great to see the students and we look forward to continuing that going forward. But thank you, Admiral. Admiral, I'd like to um, add on to the uh, answer about what the other service colleges, uh, what the other war colleges and what they're doing. Um, one of the things that's, that complicates our activities here at the Naval War College is the simultaneous um, intermediate and senior level courses. And the, the real complication comes in our electives program. So our ILC right now is in TSDM and seminars stay together. And so there's a very real possibility that each of those seminars could be considered an isolated cohort, an isolated pod, that if we can keep that isolation, we might be able to build in an opportunity for them to interact. And the same goes for our senior students in the JM and JMO. Our elective program are open to all students. So the real difficulty for in-person education right now would be each elective would represent a merging, if you will, for exposure purposes of many different cohorts. So, so the, the idea of pods and isolated cohorts would break down entirely with, our, uh, with, with the way we manage our electives. Uh, that's different than a lot of other co uh, war colleges. For example, uh, the Army, Army has their senior service college at, uh, at Carlisle Barracks and their inter intermediate course is in Fort Leavenworth. So they're able to have those run in isolation uh, from each other. Um, so I just wanted to add into that. That also ties into one of the questions that did come in via chat about can our, can our electives meet in person off campus? So as the threat working group is evaluating what phase three looks like, the approach we're taking is based on minimizing the risk of what I just talked about of mixing cohorts. And so early on, what we're seeing is the strong possibility that we're gonna continue electives fully virtual as a way to prevent any of that sort of cross exposure between the various uh, seminars within the ILC and SLC or even across those two uh, courses. Um, that being said, if we are able to come up with, with a, a method that allows seminars to conduct their, in, their, uh, their uh, seminar meetings in person on campus, we would be doing it with those uh, two courses with TSDM and with JMO. If simultaneously, if electives are choosing to meet in person off campus, we've kind of defeated the purpose of uh, maintaining that cohort isolation. So again, as a threat working group evaluates this, uh, I'd ask uh, for any educational opportunities that are gonna happen in any mode other than virtual, we really need to ask the question first and then evaluate how we can do it. Um, as an example, we recently approved uh, one of our electives to conduct a single uh, in-person uh, 
tour of the Newport area as they evaluate um, uh, war at sea in the age of sail as part of our uh, graduate certificate in maritime history. So a very important uh, part of the course and they have planned out in depth how they're going to mitigate risk. And we looked at it carefully and evaluated that the measures put in place were going to be adequate um, to help prevent any kind of possible exposure between students. And so we've approved that. But again, that request was, uh, was made. We did uh, some deliberate risk mitigation planning and we said, yes, we'll do that. Again, I would ask any, um, anyone who's wanting to meet off campus in person to please A, think about what that means for um, your fellow students and B, ask permission so we can figure out if that's okay. Um, another question that came in had to do with contact tracing. Uh, Cause before you move on, I'd like to just interject something because I did see in the chat, there are some questions about um, uh, moving activities to off campus. So we've got a restriction on campus, so let's just move them off campus. And uh, let me just assert that for sanctioned events, uh, including class experience events uh, that are related to the United States Naval War College, ultimately I own that risk. And so uh, I know it might seem just easy to say, well, we'll just move it off the campus since the campus has the restrictions. Uh, please don't neglect to understand that the United States Naval War College uh, provides the overarching uh, administration and stewardship of each of our students as they come here from their home agencies and home services and home countries. And that aggregated risk is mine to bear. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, so a couple of questions that had come in probably while I was talking, one of them is about how this mixing or breaking of cohorts affects LPA. Now LPA is unique because it's one of our core courses, but it's delivered in the mode of our electives. So as, as the threat working group evaluates what that looks like, uh, we're more than likely gonna keep LPA virtual for now as we work through uh, figuring out what, uh, how, how to get into phase three. Um, but ultimately, we'd like to get everyone in person, which is gonna take time, conditions have to be favorable, and we have to do our jobs individually and collectively at implementing all the COVID-19 measures. Um, there's a question about SCI electives, and I'd say classified electives in general, um, how those will happen. And, and I think Tim Schultz is here. I'd like to turn it over to Tim Schultz uh, to address where we are on working through that. Yes, thank you, Kaz. I appreciate it. For our classified electives, TSSCI electives, we will consider uh, offering uh, those in the spring if conditions permit. But right now, we've arranged the schedule for this academic year, so uh, we are not including uh, classified electives beyond the uh, advanced research projects that are already ongoing. But we'll keep an open mind to that possibility keeping in mind that uh, SCIF spaces are um, limited, uh, they're smaller, and they are already used to some degree. So the ability to use those in a socially distanced environment uh, will be um, a, a significant obstacle. So right now we've backed away and we'll, uh, from our classified electives and we'll keep a weather eye on slowly integrating those back into the lineup as conditions permit. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, let's see, another question that came in was one that I, I, I think I started to get to, uh, and it was about contact tracing. And the answer is yes, uh, all of us individually have a responsibility to keep track of where, we, where we've been so that in the event that there's a, a COVID-19 case in, or, in and around our areas or you know, potentially uh, individually us, we're able to answer those questions that the Rhode Island Department of Health is going to ask about where you've been and who, who you had close contact with, which remember is less than six feet for greater than 15 minutes. Uh, so yes, that continues and it's the responsibility of, of, of all of us. Uh, within campus activities, 
it's even more important to make sure you're keeping very good track of where you are, where, where you went for what time periods, so that, again, we're able to, uh, in the event we have a COVID-19 case on campus, we're able to minimize the risk to as, to as much of our team as possible. So question, are there any students who are a part of the threat working group? But that's an excellent question. And the answer is, uh, we recently had a student who was a recent graduate uh, as part of the threat working group, and he's had to move on to other responsibilities. But other than that, no, we don't have students who are part of the threat working group. But please rest assured that your equities are being well represented by the dean of students. Uh, they are, uh, the deputy dean of students and dean of students are there at every meeting. They are your voice. They are your champion, and they're very loud and vocal uh, in looking after uh, your concerns. So uh, you do have representation, even if there are no students uh, on the threat working group. Um, a question about wearing masks on campus. Wear your mask on campus. The only time you can't wear, or you can remove your mask is if you're working in your office by yourself, in which case you should have your mask ready so that if someone needs to enter and talk to you, you can quickly don your mask. And the other time would be if you are temporarily taking a, a sip of your coffee or whatever, or water or whatever you have with you, then of course you would just very quickly lower one loop, take your sip and re reseal your mask. Otherwise, you have to wear your mask on campus at all times. And I think, I think that's the, I've covered all the questions that have come in. I know we want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's uh, 1300, a little after 1300. And so Admiral, um, I'd like to turn it back over to you and maybe you can close us out uh, unless, unless I get an urgent question at the last minute. You're on mute, ma'am. Uh, sorry, I turned that off because my grandfather clock was but I wanted to say thank you to all. Uh, thank you to the chief of staff for being an excellent moderator, to our wonderful uh, deans and uh, senior leaders around the college for the uh, very hard work that you're doing uh, to make sure that we're able to deliver education uh, in this environment uh, and that we have a stable platform from which to do so. Uh, and for all the work that goes on from our staff uh, to keep the machine running. Uh, I, I really am grateful. And to students who have come here and are uh, really just uh, up and on step now, uh, deep into the studies and uh, deep into the challenges of getting to all the material and putting your best, uh, best uh, synthesis and understanding forward in the classroom. And um, I, I'm just really grateful to be here at the Naval War College to see all of this come together uh, and to see our constant improvement in this environment. So uh, great job to all, have a wonderful weekend, and I really wish you all well on this day, Patriot Day, in the United States of America, uh, a day that is so significant for us and uh, so uh, meaningful to many among us who have known of someone who has lost, some family that has suffered, and uh, just, Please take care of each other and be good to each other uh, today and into this weekend. Thank you.